Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Assembly Lines Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Torrance. First of all, let me apologize for the long delay in getting out a new episode. Uh, it's been a crazy fall with teaching and also with my full-time job. But here we are, and this episode I want to talk to you about the newest version of ProDOS, ProDOS 2.4.1, that I wanted to dive in and see what's new in there and also show you the Easter egg that I found hiding inside the coke. So let's get started. So ProDOS, which was released in 1983, continued to work on all Apple II computers as long as you had 64K of memory up until version 1.9. Beyond version 1.9, it only worked on enhanced Apple IIe's. The last version was actually in 1993, and that was version 2.0.3. So for example, on my Apple II Plus, if we try to play Dagan Brock's Flapple Bird. This disc uses ProDOS version 2.0.3. So on my Apple II Plus, you can see we get a message saying that I need to have an enhanced Apple IIe. So to fix this, John Brooks, with help from Peter Furry, aka Cucumba, decided they were going to release a brand new version of ProDOS, version 2.4. And this version actually fixes a lot of bugs that were in the original one. It adds some new features. It's actually smaller in size. And it works on all unenhanced Apple IIs all the way back to the original Apple II, even one with Integer Basic. So let's go ahead and we'll try it out. So you can see version 2.4.1 released 16th August 2016. Here the very first thing we see is actually the awesome Bitsy by file chooser. So this is a brand new program that John Brooks and Peter Faree added to ProDOS and it just comes built in. And it lets you scroll through all of the files on the disk. You can go down into subdirectories. You can actually change to different disks by hitting just the numbers say one through six or seven and the tab key. And you can actually run programs with this Bitsy Buy. For example, if I click on the view readme, this will actually open up the readme file. So this is an Applesoft program, which just brings up the readme for the disk. It also comes with a copy of Copy2 Plus, as well as ADT Pro. And then finally in the 2E utils subdirectory, there are a bunch of disk utilities, many of which were written by Glenn Braden of Merlin fame. But what I was interested in was the actual Bitsy Buy program itself, because John Brooks and Peter Free spent a lot of time trying to optimize this so it would fit in under 300K of memory. And they also put out a little teaser saying that there was an Easter egg hidden somewhere inside it. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna take it apart and see if we can find the Easter egg. So to do this, I first started out with firing up the ProDOS 241 disk inside Virtual 2. And once it had started, then I was actually able to go into the inspector and take a look at what was going on. So if we just go under Machine, Show Inspector, first thing I need to do is actually locate the code. So where is Bitsy by? And to do this, I just did a break. And because I knew that it was currently looking for a keystroke, then I was able to backtrace from the current location of memory to the call stack. And you can see here that it's being called from 1129. And if we go there, we are right smack in the middle of some sort of call to FD0C, which is just the read key routine. And then from that point, I was able to just trace backwards and figure out that the start of Bitsy Buy was at 1000. So all right, before we dive into the actual code, I just want to show you the three references that were invaluable. The first was the Apple II reference manual, and this is my original one that I got with my Apple II Plus. Uh, next was the Beneath Apple ProDOS, and you'll definitely need this to understand the calls to ProDOS to do things like read a file, get the catalog, etc. 
and then finally the assembly lines book uh, by Roger Wagner and so here's a dump of the assembly from 1000 through 1300. The code is divided up into essentially four main sections. So at the beginning of Bitsy Buy, it's just doing a lot of setup, it's drawing some text on the screen, it goes ahead and it gets the list of file names from the directory, and then finally it prints all those names out to the screen. From there it goes on, it does some more printing out, and then it goes into the keyboard handling routines. So that starts around 1127. Uh, starting with 112E where it handles the return key and then it just processes all the different keys for Bitsy Buy. And the fourth section are the disk handling routines and so there's two of those. Uh, one starting at 1254 is where it gets the volume name for the disk that you're accessing and then at 1294 it's actually opening and reading a file and this could also be a directory as well so if you're trying to get a list of the files. And then it ends around uh, 1300 hex and from that point on there's data and if we take a look at the data real quick I also printed that out and that's divided into two pieces starting at 1300 is a bunch of static text so here you can see it says Bitsy Buy by John Brooks and Peter Free uh, it's got some text for the menu items and then from 1400 down is where it actually stores the current catalog for the directory that you're in. So let's go back and look at the code again. As you might expect, for something that only fits in 300 hex bytes, the code is really tight. Uh, if you want to see some well-written assembly code and just see a lot of tricks, go through the code yourself and see what's going on. But just as a real quick example, if we look at this section here, from about 1037 down, it's all it's doing is printing out the static text. So this is the names of the authors and the dashes on the screen. Uh, but what it's doing is it's actually reading that data like we were saying from 1300. And there's a trick here where if it reads an ASCII letter, so anything above 128 or higher, then it goes ahead and it just prints it to the screen. But if it finds a byte that actually does not have the high bit set, in other words, it's not a screen character, then it actually jumps to a different location of the code and this is used to calculate the line address of the next line of text. John and Peter were able to do this with the exact same loop by essentially having an instruction that on the one hand, right here, it's a bit instruction and this is actually just a no-op because there's nothing at 2891. So when you come through the loop one way, when you're just trying to calculate the offset within the line it just hits this bit instruction and ignores it and continues on but when you're actually printing the characters to the screen you can see it does a branch to 1045 which jumps right smack in the middle of that line and it does the store so that's a really clever way of actually combining two instructions into one where the one is a no-op and the other one actually does something and that's just one example of some of the tricks that are used inside the code. All right, so on to the Easter egg. The first thing I did is just kind of scoured the code for some simple tricks or something. Maybe there was like a keyboard a shortcut that did something, but I didn't really find anything. The only thing I found that was sort of weird was when you try to launch a file, say an Applesoft file or something, it looked like it was actually trying to load a file from the disk called basis.system and this is really weird because there is no file named that it should be basic.system if we switch over to that actual code uh, that's in the return key section it tries to read the file basis.system if it can't find it then it just replaces the letter s with a c and goes ahead and loads basic.system and then runs your program now, if there is a basis.system, then what it does is it actually reads that file instead into memory, and then it just jumps straight down to trying to launch the program. So if you create a program called basis.system, then what Bitsy Buy will do is actually run that first before running your program. And so what this lets you do is actually put a hook into the system where you can imagine having this basis.system be say some sort of driver file or some program that does some sort of setup. So this is the Easter egg and what it really is is actually just a hook that's built into the new Prodos. 
So to demonstrate this Easter egg, I've created a very simple Hello World program in AppleSoft. And let's first run this just with the straight Bitsy Buy disk with no Easter egg in it. And if I run this, it's going to load up basic.system and then finally it's going to run my Hello World. So now, instead of doing that, let's go ahead and we will create our own basis.system and have that get loaded first. So on the Prodos 2.4.1 disk inside the mini base directory, there's actually a version of basic.system that's really bare bones. It's only 1K and all it does is it loads just enough of Prodos to be able to run a single file or B run a file. And it doesn't load any of the rest of the AppleSoft Prodos hooks. So it's short, it's lightweight, and it'd be great to put onto a disk where you don't need to actually do a lot of Prodos commands. So we're going to use this as our basis.system. So I'll go ahead and I'll copy that over into the top level and just rename it. And we will fire up our hello world program and hopefully it'll take a lot less time because we're going to be using our basis.system. So there you can see at the bottom there's our hook, there's our basis.system and when we choose hello and hit return it'll load basis.system and this time it'll actually find it. It'll load that instead of basic.system and so let's see what happens. All right, so you can see it worked. It loaded up and AppleSoft was ready to go. It was a lot faster because it didn't have to load the entire basic.system. Uh, there's a lot of other use cases for this basis.system. You could put it as a startup file if it was the first dot .system file on the disk. Uh, you could just use it as a hook if you wanted to load a driver. And there's a bunch of other options for this. But that's the Easter egg that's inside of Bitsy Buy. All right, so we've seen how Bitsy Buy works and how Prodos 2.4.1 works. And there's a lot of disks that were originally released for the Apple IIe, IIc, etc. on Prodos 2.0. And those actually could all be converted now to 2.4.1, which would make them compatible with older Apple IIs like the 2 Plus or even the original Apple II. Uh, so ADT Pro, for example, just came out with its latest version and it now ships with Prodos 241. And thanks to John Brooks and Peter Furry for releasing such an awesome update to Prodos. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.